All right, let's do this. The top 10 episodes of season 10. The T10 of S10, if you will. Featuring Elton. I took all 23 episodes, eliminated six right off the bat to get our semifinalists, and then after surprisingly little deliberation, tossed out seven more to get our top 10. Don't know if this season is just not as deep as others, or if the cream rises to the top more easily this year. We shall see. Here are my top 10 episodes of season 10. Wild Bart's Can't Be Broken is one of those that's filled with so many good ideas, but runs into these little execution things that holds it back. It's that annoying, yeah, but episode of the year. It has a good sense of conflict, but Chief Wiggum is dialed up about 20% too obnoxious. It ends with this awesome musical showdown, but the lyrics are kind of awful. Homer's bandwagon stuff is amusing, but it makes me hate him more than is necessary. I think it has a great central concept, though. Feels like one of those classic 90s Nickelodeon kids versus adult stories. It hits its stride in Act 2 with the observational jokes about being stuck in the house and all that bloodening stuff. We get a strong sense of the kids' injustice in this situation. The story is well constructed, lots of setup and payoff throughout. The rivalry, the adult secrets, this giant billboard. I suppose the pacing can be a little weird in places though, like this billboard reveal it doesn't hit quite as hard as the episode wishes it did. Even though Wild Bart's can't be broken, it feels like the whole is less than the sum of its parts, those individual parts are good enough to sneak onto this countdown. I have never been a travel episode guy, you all know this by now, but 30 minutes over Tokyo stands out as one of the best, especially from these middle seasons. The competition isn't exactly stellar, but whatever. This episode is pretty much one memorable moment after another. The Rashomon joke, Homer walking through the doors, the seizure robots, the fancy prison, the magic fish, the game show. Even the pre-travel stuff is pretty solid. The family becoming super savers suits this kind of story well. Jokes about wacky Japanese game shows and famous celebrities hawking products are a little played out these days, but this predated a lot of that stuff in American comedies. Speaking of America, I've always felt like this America town scene is a wasted opportunity. I get what they're satirizing with how tourists can be. I just wish they used this time to show us something else about the country they're visiting. Like a lot of travel episodes, 30 minutes over Tokyo does feel kind of aimless. There isn't much of a story to tie everything together here. They literally go broke because Homer randomly does something stupid. But as a loose collection of jokes, it gets the job done. Here's the quick Trials of Horror 9 rundown. Segment 1, very good, kinda rushed. Segment 2, very funny, not that scary. Segment 3, hot trash. Alright, maybe the Jerry Springer segment isn't hot trash. I guess it does have a few laughs in it. The Maggie stuff at the beginning is pretty solid. But my god is this the most dated thing ever. I enjoy it more for its sense of nostalgia rather than anything it has to say about Jerry Springer. The Itchy and Scratchy segment is probably my favorite of the three. The animation jokes are well executed, very meta, etc, etc. And it's such a unique opportunity to bring Itchy and Scratchy together with Bart and Lisa. When else could this possibly happen? Also, hey Poochie. Bye Poochie. With Hell to Pay, I appreciate that they gave us this more grounded and suspenseful segment. Homer's transformation is kind of terrifying, that juxtaposition between his and Snake's mannerisms. They cram a surprising amount of plot into this one segment, so it doesn't have that much time to build suspense, but Homer's sinister performance gets it over the hump. So when in doubt, just have Homer possessed by something. The force of his personality should carry the day. Homer to the Max is the best episode of season 10. Up until its final act. The first half of this thing is so much fun. Homer just crushes all of this stuff. This super impressionable and dopey version that the writers deliver. Look at his childlike wonder over sharing his name with the police cops character. How he goes around with that scarf. How crestfallen he is when the character changes. There's elements of the Poochie episode in here, full of pointed commentary about the TV industry and associated meta jokes. Then, when Homer changes his name, we get jokes like the monogram shirt and the Max Power theme song. 
It's cool how long they hold on this scene, that they just let us all enjoy the performance and the character acting. It stands out in a season without many extended character moments. Unfortunately, the final act throws most of this stuff out the window. It feels like the writers had a funny episode concept and had no idea where to go with it. So they got Ed Begley Jr. and threw the characters into an environmental crusade. There are some good jokes here, but it's ultimately pointless. I suppose that means that it doesn't totally invalidate all the good stuff before. Homer to the Max just left some money on the table. That's all. You know what's refreshing about Mayor to the Mob? That it features a guest star prominently, but he doesn't dominate the story. How they brought in Mark Hamill as the focal point of their topical opening set piece, and then they just put him on the back burner and bring him back for the climax of the story. Also, there's this guy, but I mean the celebrity playing himself. There's nice balance to it. There's not a lot to Homer's storyline, it's just him learning how to be a bodyguard and then riffing on Mayor Quimby and Fat Tony jokes for an entire act. It's not complicated. You bring in Fat Tony and you're gonna bring in some laughs. I like how Homer's written here. He has an appealing mix of obliviousness, enthusiasm, and determination. Then, when Mark Hamill shows up again, it sort of ties the whole story together. It makes the opening set piece feel less disposable, instead building a world where Mark Hamill just happened to be in Springfield. I complain about the lyrics and Wild Bart's Can't Be Broken, but I could never slander this Guys and Dolls musical. Mark Hamill can sing whatever lyrics he wants. I don't think it has any super iconic jokes, and it can be kind of corny sometimes, but that's okay. Mayor to the Mob puts on a show that is equal parts luminous, magnetic, and incandescent. Move over, Mark Hamill. Wizard of Evergreen Terrace is actually the most balanced episode of season 10. It contains this satisfying mix of wacky, over-the-top humor and understated observational stuff. We can all relate to Homer trying to brainstorm, can laugh at the various lengths that he goes to to put something together. And then you get the wacky reveals. That hammer, the toilet chair, the alarm, the makeup gun. Homer is so far gone at this point that Lisa has to remind him that women won't enjoy being shot in the face. You would have thought that he'd learned that lesson last year. It's generally a good spotlight for the different aspects of Homer's personality. The impulsive and moody side, the intensely passionate and oblivious side, his jealousy and anger. It does end in a third act scheme, which is a dime a dozen in season 10, but the Edison poster ties everything together. It uses its plot elements well, setting up the chair invention and then calling back to Homer's other ones. I wouldn't say it's the most unique episode in the world. These Homer passion projects can sometimes feel samey, Still, The Wizard of Evergreen Terrace hits all of these familiar beats well. Mom and Pop Art is making it to number 4 in this countdown because of Le Grill. I think this is, far and away, the best joke in all of Season 10. It's so beautifully executed. The comedic timing of the stuff falling in the cement, Dan Castellaneta's vocal delivery, the way everything escalates, love this cut to the kitchen to close it out. Top tier Simpsons joke right here, wouldn't change a millisecond. Unfortunately, I find the rest of the episode kinda sleepy, particularly in Act 2. Homer building his art isn't that dynamic to watch, and the spectacle around it feels underplayed. It could have used a smidge of that Wizard of Evergreen Terrace energy. It does improve in its final act though, with all those clever art jokes and that visually striking dream sequence. The Homer-Marge conflict works well, especially linking up her backstory, and it does lead to a sweet ending between them. And hey, it's got everything's coming up Millhouse, which is essentially his catchphrase at this point. So yeah, while I'm always going to remember this one for Le Grill, there are enough memorable moments in its back half to avoid being a one-scene wonder. So I said in the retrospective that I couldn't decide if Sunday Cruddy Sunday was totally stupid or utterly brilliant. I guess I've decided to embrace the stupidity. This thing is a mess. There's little to no structure in the story, several of the jokes don't land, and the pacing is all over the place. I mean they had four different writers to cobble this thing together. It's gonna be disjointed. 
but there's at least a level of self-awareness to it. That every step of the way, it knows it's a farce, and doesn't try to convince the audience otherwise. There's no awkward character arc or confused moral. Instead, they focus on filling this thing with memorable jokes. Curing Marge's foot pain. The tickets printed on some sort of cracker. Oh, hi, Ahmad. The suggestive church commercial. Basically everything that Fred Willard says. There's a bunch of just plain weird jokes too, like convincing Lenny over the phone, or Rudy chasing after the bus. And let's not forget the Atlanta Falcons. Even in the year 2021, it still gets a laugh out of me. I mean, come on, we've got Vincent Price's egg magic here, the most aggressively pointless B-plot in Simpsons history. The thing is like three scenes long. They pick an activity, they do the activity, they call about the missing feet. That's it, that's the B-plot. I could see why some people hate this episode, call it one of the worst, but for me, I just appreciate its honesty. If you're going to make an aggressively silly and pointless episode, you may as well go all in. I wanted a fun Super Bowl party, and I got it. Who cares if it doesn't make a lick of sense? If you saw my season seven list, this pick shouldn't be surprising at all. Bart the Mother is pretty much a sequel to Marge Be Not Proud, this time with a twist ending. Yet again, we've got Bart being peer pressured, Marge becoming exasperated with him, Bart trying to hide something from her, culminating in a sweet emotional moment between the two. In the first half, it's not exactly breaking new ground. But the lizard stuff in Act 3? I think it's a darn clever twist on this formula. It's not simply a redemption story for Bart, Instead, he and Marge develop a shared perspective about parenting. That moment where Marge tells him that she completely understands how he feels, and then helps him escape? Such an underrated moment in the series. Where else are you gonna get Marge and Bart relating to each other like this? The episode is sneaky funny too. The Family Fun Center provides some observational and wacky humor. We get some amusing Nelson character stuff. Homer falling down the stairs three times. And of course, one final hilarious performance by Phil Hartman in the series. I guess the lizard stuff is still a pretty weird swerve for the story, feels kind of discordant tonally, but I've really come to appreciate what it offers to this kind of story. I don't mind injecting a little bit of season 10 energy into this season 7 story. Lisa Gets an A is a lot like Bart the Mother in that it effortlessly applies a season 10 twist to a very familiar formula. We've seen these kinds of stories before, where a character does something wrong, feels guilty, and eventually fesses up. Think of stuff like The Telltale Head or Lisa's Rival as a couple of examples. Lisa's a great protagonist for this narrative structure. We get to see a different side of her personality while watching her struggle through an ethical dilemma. But instead of drawing things out, Lisa confesses almost immediately, and it evolves into this wacky grift over grant money. I enjoy its self-awareness, that the characters in the audience know that Lisa's going to confess again. So they go for the screw the audience sort of ending. Let's give a hand to the real comptroller. It's so frickin' funny. I appreciate how they gave us this hilarious and wacky twist ending that actually is foreshadowed, while not throwing away Lisa's actual character arc. Much like with Bart the Mother, this is the kind of third act swerve I wish season 10 could convincingly pull off more often. And of course, we gotta talk about Pinchy, the star of one of the all-time best B-plots. This legitimately feels like the kind of thing they would do in seasons 3 or 4. It suits Homer's character so well. Homer's enthusiasm is infectious, how he grows such a fondness for Pinchy over time. The only downside to the B-plot is the presence of jerk-ass Marge, who is cruel and mean to poor defenseless Pinchy, who is in fact the best character on the show and whose memory will live on for multiple generations, unlike a certain lady who only wanted to eat him because of her latent road rage and gambling problems, while pure boy Pinchy has no flaws and that crab on the beach was some pathetic and irrelevant bully, just like Marge. There, I said it. R.I.P. Pinchy, you touched our lives and were delicious. Pass the butter. Just missing out on this top 10 list, I have I'm with Cupid at number 17, Make Room for Lisa at number 16, and Marge Simpson and Screaming Yellow Honkers at number 15. Then they save Lisa's brain, Simpson's Bible stories, Doan in the Wind, and Lard of the Dance as the number 11 bubble episode. 
I really enjoy Lisa's banter with Alex in the Lard episode. There's a lot of fantastic wordplay throughout. Almost bumped Wild Bards can't be broken for it, to be honest. Let me know in the comments what your favorite episodes of Season 10 are and how you'd rank them. Are some of these overrated? Maybe underrated? Is putting Sunday Cruddy Sunday at number 3 a crime against rationality? The heart wants what it wants, and in my case, I wanted Egg Magic and Vincent Price. Up next is the wild and wacky world of Season 11, which features drugged up livestock, badass racehorses, and Schrodinger's alligator. I'm currently stockpiling vodka in advance for the rewatch. I can already tell this video is going to be a thing. But we'll worry about that later. As for now, thanks for watching.